Kentucky when you're ready. Thanks, folks. I'm Pam Neville. I'm chairman of St. Bernard Citizens for Environmental Quality. We're sitting right now in front of the Murphy Oil Facility, a subsidiary of the Spur Company uh, here in Chalmette. You can see the, it is one of the facilities which has the closest amount of population around it. Right now we're in a trailer cart that is right up on the fence line by the Murphy facility. This is one of the older facilities. It's been here for a very, very long time and um, we have had to deal with a number of problems here. The, the facility has grown more and more. It has expanded through the buffer zone and there is any, no longer any buffer zone. We, this facility has HF stored on it. It has a number of hazardous materials. It has not come up to standards for the Clean Air Act. It is in constant violation. And they have a hired crew of people who spend their time at the legislature, uh, who go back and try to erode all the work that we are trying to get done. They do not care about the individuals that live around this facility. Uh, they care about the bottom line. Uh, we have worked with them for a number of years trying to get them to clean up their act and any time that they go up for a permit or anything new, they tell us, well, we're coming up to standards and it's costing us X amount of millions of dollars and we're not making any profit and everything else and you should be glad of what we're doing and um, it's just not true. They are still not coming up. They're constantly in violation. The noise pollution here is unbelievable. The amount of emissions is unbelievable. Uh, in Louisiana, they do their own reporting, and they are not honest. We have tried to track many different times the amount of pollution and, uh, that they have got. Who are we to know? Well, I, you know, I'm just a housewife, uh, a business owner. How am I to know that they're putting out um, X amount of pollution. All I can tell you is that it stinks around this facility, that their flare is burning dark colored constantly. Their answer is that, well, it's within our permitted amounts. Um, I feel so terribly frustrated that there is no one out there that cares about me or my kids. They only care about the bottom line and their dollar. I can never fight the amount of dollars that they have. Uh, you can go to the legislature and I can spend days at the legislature um, with our uh, led people in NH, they're they'll tell you one minute they're going to vote for a bill to make it better and then the next minute they don't. They're not accountable. No one's accountable to the people here. Right here in this trailer cart there's a young woman who has three children who has lived here all her life. She considers this place a good place to live to raise her kids because it's a nice trailer court. It's not in the poor section of town, the bad section of town. yet. She's got two kids with heart trouble that have been born with heart trouble, and she truly believes it's not because she lives next to this facility. The third child has such, well, two of them, of the other, of the children have allergies, terrible allergies, and, and the third child has uh, a number of lung and breathing problems, and yet this mother who spends her day, she lives on welfare, taking these kids back and forth to a doctor. One of the children is really in desperate need of a transplant and does not see that this facility is the reason. She's been talked to and brainstormed enough by so many people that she truly does not believe. She thinks she's doing the right thing and she's doing the good thing, you know, by, by being here and being in this neighborhood. And it just hurts to know that that child has suffered because of this and not a soul cares. Um, I belong to the Accident Prevention Regulation Advisory Board for the state. And we're writing accident prevention regulations. And a prime example of that is um, the Murphy facility decided that it was going to, um, that they were going to uh, send in uh, people from the Mopal and the Murphy facility, send someone to tell them how they think that they should write their regulations. And um, they sat there and there was 41 suits at this meeting and two mamas. And those 41 suits all agreed, including our DEQ regulations, that they should go by OSHA guidelines. OSHA guidelines stop at the fence line. They do not protect people in the community. And they are just, they've worked up great big proposals. They had all kind of money, big slideshows. They have gone to EPA with all of these things. And they tell us, oh, you, you're putting in so many regulations and now the new Republicans that are gonna be in are gonna cut out all my regulate, our, our money to even fight these things. Here, there's the church where there was a school there. 
there is approximately 800 students uh, in the school and about 400 children in daycare now. They've got a large daycare at this um, Catholic school right there, which is right across the street from the uh, mobile refinery. Uh, down about two blocks away uh, is the Murphy, is the uh, Miro School. Miro School has approximately 800 students there. We also have um, about a half a mile away, right across from the, still across from the same mobile facility, Raleigh School, which has approximately 600 students at their site. And if there was an incident, we do not have a plan that would get these kids out of this school fast enough they wouldn't get hurt. Uh, we don't have enough school buses. Do you realize how many school buses it would take to evacuate these kids from these schools? We have, um, we have, uh, the Catholic school teacher, who's principal, who's been told, who uses the public school buses, that her kids will be last. So she can just consider her kids are going to be dead. Her kids will be last because their their um, parochial school and the school board is going to evacuate their own kids first. I mean, how would you feel if you know? And where you live? I'm Ann Shonowitz. I live in Mary Ann Trailer Park at Lot 3D. And we have a problem with Murphy back here, turning the jets up, black soot coming out of them. And you call them up and you tell them about it and they tell you that it's from Mobile. They even came to my house and told me all that was from Mobile down the road by Parish Road when they're right next door. Um, sometimes at night you can hear it when it, they turn the flame up here to release the gas or whatever they do. It's lot 3D and we have a little problem with Murphy. They turn their jets up and Black suck comes out, it gets all over your trailer, all over your cars, your vehicles, swing sets. Then when they turn them up, it also vibrates the trailer. On the inside of my trailer, I have sheetrock, and it cracks my sheetrock, and I have to keep remolding it. You have to reset your blocks every so often because the vibration of it breaks your blocks. Tell me about your little girl. Does she have any allergies or anything? Um, she's allergic to insects, but she's been like that since she was little. Not that I know of. The only thing I've noticed is that some people that live right around here, they have a bad problem with diarrhea. When you leave from here, you don't have it. You know, you go somewhere else and drink the water and, you know, breathe fresh air, and you come back and you don't have it. She has a problem with colds being around here. She catches cold f frequently. I don't know if it's just because of Murphy. Yeah. Money knows is all that. You said there was a big explosion? Yeah, um, last year sometime it blew up and they had a big fire and they had all the traffic from St. Bernard Highway cutting through the trailer park and they didn't know whether we should evacuate or not. They never came and told us anything about it. We just heard a loud boom. She was sleeping and I picked her up and ran outside and I pulled something in my back at that time. I went to the hospital that very evening because of it. Everybody in here was outside. There's a woman that lives right over there. She has like a cancer on her face. I'm not sure if it's from that or just natural causes, but <laughs> they have a little term they call um, Jacob Drive Cancer Alley. So something, something needs to be done about it, serious. Can you? Uh... These levees right here were built for the containment of the overflow of the tanks. If something was to happen, one of the tanks was busted. Just this past six months, they built a new tank down here. Um, as far as I can find out, they don't have no code uh, permit or anything to have built one. And I want to know if that levee there is going to hold all that fuel, like because those were built years ago, and now they've built extra tanks. I want to know if all that's going to contain that. And plus, there was sandblasting and painting out here with no covers, and there was dust everywhere. And they power rolled it, but it still didn't do nothing for the sand. Can you, um... I called the DEQ that time for it. They had a uh, man came out and checked it out and told them they had to put tarps up. So they put one up and it flapped on the side of the tank and they were blasting around the other side. One of the blasts. No, I think they need more regulations because you, sometimes you can walk out here and the DEQ will tell you that the uh, eggs odor like sour eggs or spoiled eggs is some kind of nitro something, a hydro nitro something like that and that it's bad for you if it's breathed after a prolonged period of time. And I've lived here for two years. I want to know, you know, how long I've got to breathe this before it affects my body system or, you know, my health because of it. you notice the odors a lot? When the wind blows from that way, you smell it all the time. When the wind's blowing from this way, the other side smells it. And you can 
behind you there, can you describe what we're seeing out of the flares? Is that what you were talking about? Uh, no, it turns black, black, and they get about uh, about 20 foot higher than that, 30 foot higher maybe. I've got pictures of it being real high. The flames are 30 feet high? Yeah, <laughs> the flames, and then there's black smoke coming out of it. Sometimes it goes up in a mushroom and it comes back, and you see the fire. When the mushroom goes up, you don't see no fire, but after it makes the circle, you see fire. And see these trucks? They're not supposed to be riding through there. Um, Murphy states that no other trucks except for security, the Bayou security, is supposed to be back there and you have them coming through all hours of the morning, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Before you even wake up you hear the trucks and tractors and everything else riding through. Can you tell us how often? Never. I've been here for two years and I don't think I've ever seen them cut off except for the one on that side, the top of it blew off at, at another time. The round thing at the top was uh, messed up or something and it popped real loud. Everybody came outside, was you know worried about what happened. But it was shut off for about maybe a week. But other than that, they've never been shut off. I live at Marion Trailer Cart, lot 7D. And lately, I, I, I haven't had you know headaches like I have since I've moved here. And I've been getting headaches awfully bad every day, in fact every day and sinus my sinuses i live uh, it's, it's been and i do believe that it is from this plant and i'm right directly next to it can you tell us what uh, some of your other concerns are living next to an oil refinery like this oh well i'm very frightened that you know any day or any any time that it could you know have some kind of explosion or something and uh <laughs> it would be just wiped out you know i'm very very frightened of that uh, for your family as well as yourself? My, my daughter and I. My daughter and I live there alone. Diane, I think that the stuff that comes from there, whatever it is that they released from, the, the, from this plant, it's got me that I get dizzy, my head, just every single day I get headaches. I have sinus. It's, I think it's got me with sinus. I've never had headaches before in my life. I was very healthy. You know, mm -hmm. if you'd hear her sleeping at night, you'd wonder, uh, because she's like really hard of breathing. And I do believe that is caused from whatever they're releasing from this plant. I really do. What they mean that there isn't any more worth doing. I think maybe they ought to try to stop releasing this, this pollution, whatever. I notice when it rains and it's got bad weather, they release it like at night when it's raining real hard and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess to try to camouflage it or whatever. Well, you can't smell it so bad. I'm not really sure, but I believe that. So um, if the companies are saying that they need less regulation, that it's already too costly, you disagree with that? Yes, I certainly do. I think they should do something else uh, about this. Because I am not the only one that complains about the pollution. That, that's what it is. And I can't afford to move my trailer, you know. There's no way I can afford to move it. I guess I'm um, just stuck here. My name's Kenneth Fuller. I live at number 12 Carroll Drive in Chalmette. We're in Chalmette, by the way. The population of our community is about 70,000 people. And uh, we're just so close. We have so many people so close to this industry that I find that something has to be done. Just what, I don't know. We need help, though. We need help. But uh, Mobile has just put a hydrogen there in the process of putting a hydrogen line in, 12-inch line, and bring hydrogen in. We're not sure what it's for. They're trying to look like it's trying to be done quietly. And uh, we're confused on this. If they told us hydrogen couldn't hurt you. But heck, I heard hydrogen like the hydrogen bomb. You know, <laughs> maybe it's a different type of hydrogen. I don't know if they said hydrogen is uh, couldn't hurt you, wouldn't cause any problem. What are your, uh... My family's health, my children's health, and my neighbor's health would be my main, main thing. The second thing, I guess, we need jobs in our community. And while welcome, we need these jobs. Man, they, we got so many people in my area depend on this facility here and other facilities to make a living, so their children can be educated. We need them. But we have to work together. We have to listen to each other. We should be able to sit at a, be able to sit at a table and say, hey, I have a problem. I thought you did this, or you did, uh, I, I could be an error. And don't defend yourself too, they defend themselves too quickly before they finish hearing what problems we think that they are creating. 
different? Yeah, they, we, we can't get correct information from these companies. And what has happened is, uh, see how DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality of Louisiana, is in Metairie. And if I called them right now because of a problem these people are having, by the time they got here, it would be a half, it would be at least 45 minutes, or plenty of times, hey, they funded. They don't have enough money to do the job, but they know how to do it. And it may take them two days to come here. And they'll come here and they'll look, they say, Mr. Ford, the wind's blowing out the north. It couldn't be hurting me. I mean, it was something so foolish, but this is the type of problem we do run across. We, uh, we need help, and we need the jobs also. And we need, we need people to step forward and really voice their opinion. There's apathy in my parish. Everybody talks about this over the fence half the time, but they don't talk about it. They'll walk out there. If you saw the monument, people go to the monument to run for their health, and they're running up inhaling all, all these uh, odors that we don't know what they are. Many a times, personally, I have called out the fire department. They come out here, they verify, hey, we smell it. DEQ says, hey, we smell it. They say they don't know what it is. You ask them if it's safe or unsafe, and they say they don't know it, they don't know what it is. But it's coming from a chemical company, and it makes you wonder. And then yet people tell me, they say, hey, it's not what you can smell you should worry about, it's what you don't smell. So we definitely need uh, help. We need, we, need, we need more money put in the environmental protection system in the what? community. A time ago when they were a little bitty company, it, it maybe it would have relaxed them a little bit, but I disagree with that. Because this, for, and just to give an idea what I have to say about that is, this, co this corporation across the street keeps expanding. They continually expand and getting closer and closer to the borderline, which, which borders them in the residential area. Now they say they want to be good neighbors and they don't want to pollute us. Well, why don't they make up a buffer zone? And don't tell me 40 years ago they didn't have a buffer zone, because today they could have created a buffer zone. In the past few years they could have created one. But if you go down, they're buying everybody's property out and they're defeating the paper, they're putting it where it can be even more harmful to the people. So I disagree that they are actually trying to, I think it's a stockholder corporation, they ain't there to make money. They're not here to satisfy me, Mr. Ford or Ms. Neville or the people here. They're here to make money. And the day they can't make money, they're going to close down. But uh, I, think it's a, I think they use the words of wisdom. I think they use words in their favor, and they know how to do it quite well. Mobile has facilities that tell you which way the wind's blowing. But I've been here so many times, and it must be the wind tolerance currents. One stack will be blowing southeast a lot of times. The other stack will be blowing south. And other times, it's really, it's really confusing. So really, it depends strictly on seeing they had a northeast wind or southeast wind. It's, it's good that it's a reference. But if you come out here and actually see the wind, sometimes it's contradictory exactly what's going on. But anyway, looking at mobile refinery, and right now the wind is about 170 degrees. I can tell you, about 170 degrees coming from mobile. All right, I actually live north, I live northwest of here, so it would take a southeast wind to come to my residence, which is about three quarters of a mile away. I got three quarters of a mile away. If you notice right now, the river flare is flaring, and it flares pretty often. It's a, I don't know what's coming out of it. Plenty of times we get a lot of black smoke, and uh, I just feel it. In, I just feel that there's too much slack in the regulations, such as when I ask, you know, what can be done about this is what is hurting me? Could this stuff hurt me? And mobile will say they have a permit to blow these things out in there, but they won't say it is hurting you, it's not hurting you. And permitted or unpermitted, I think there should be regulations or some type of a monitor. As I was just I was just informed about some type of a laser monitor, half monitor. That maybe if this parish had or someone in the community had it, a responsible organization such as uh, environmental director for the parish could come out here and periodically check these things to make sure what there is uh, input we get from mobile is correct or not. Because many times I've caught them contradicting so many issues. But uh, Plenty of times I see this, 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 this steam with plenty, plenty of yellow in it. It's blowing real little right now. Big, big, and plenty, plenty of yellow in it. And uh, sometimes there's a, there's a candelabrum uh, right about up in here, flare, you can't see it, that it's, 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 it blows in excess. Huge, huge amounts of uh, fire. Now, what, I guess they're uh, burning up all the chemicals there. But we need help. Hey, we need help. We need more than an EPA. And I was at one meeting not too long ago in Laplace. They have a uh, environmental justice program that the EPA just started. It's new, but I think it's to help people like myself in the small communities who know nothing about the uh, 
environment, how to handle it. We're not educated enough to do it the possible educators. But uh, St. Bernard was left out in it. They didn't even know St. Bernard was on a map at this EPA. Bill. That myself and my nephew put up three years ago. I want to shoot a see something. Just this year, I got to see. And every time I bring it somebody's attention, they just feel See what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's this. Uh, this is all eaten galvanized. This is attacked. I guess by to get the part that's blocked off and the wind hits the it, it's still like new. That's about just three and a half years old. When I put chain, uh, when I put these little chain pulls for the fan up, they only last about six months when you pull them yeah. forward. But this, yeah, I keep trying to. I said this is a. I didn't, I didn't plan this, but you look at it's a prime example of uh, you know wood talk. You can, I can smell it. Is this car? Hold your head. I bring my little nephew, my little grandbaby out here to play. You, you can just... Look, let me show you something. That's cool. That's a, that's a damn sham. In my opinion, it's a sham. My name is Mark McGee. I live at 10607 Highway 23, Belchase, Louisiana, in Plaquemines Parish. I'm uh, here before you now to express a concern about the, uh, the uh, petrochemical and the oil facilities in the Plaquemines area or even as far as that statewide, it's a very broad subject. It's a deep concern. It concerns everybody. Um, some topics that concern me most is, is air releases, water release, and the fact of the uh, responsible care program, which seems to only suit those that it's benefited for. For instance, the petrochemical industry in my area the Oak Point facility of Chevron Petrochemical has manipulated and controlled the local governments to do an improper environmental impact study which was claimed to be bogus. The fact that these are lies and manipulations can bring forth a lot of other concerns such as if you're doing your own analysis and self-governing, you could get just about whatever you pay for. Who's to say that these releases are accurate when you're doing your own self-regulating? How can we believe this if we can't believe your studies? When your air emissions come out and you don't have any proper equipment to gauge these releases, how can you tell us that they're not harmful? This is uh, actually a small world, and we should all be deeply concerned about what's going on. And if you're going to misrepresent the truth, and you're going to lie to your local constituents, and you're going to mistreat your residents, and not really be responsible, then where do we go? If we're to be thwarted by the DEQ, if we're to be convinced by the DEQ that we have no worries while they find an easy back door, to cover their own backsides, or maybe it's just that they're appointed. Where does the responsible care come in when you're talking about your children, your livelihoods, and your future? Which planet are you going to move to next? I would like to say that I'm tired of being misrepresented. I'm tired of being lied to and blocked by the DEQ, by whatever means that they find possible to cover themselves. I'm tired of the petrochemical and the oil refineries 
telling me I don't have anything to worry about when my nose senses are telling me different. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, first off, I, I would say that if they stop spending so much money on trying to, to cover themselves and to, to hide the truths and put that money to at least winning the assurances of the people that they are being honest, then, then if there's additional cost, that that should be put forward into the product. Why, why should we import a product and, and develop it or produce a product from a byproduct and have this waste and we're selling it overseas at a cheaper rate? Let the price of this material cost be cost efficient. You can't sell a product out the front door and be throwing a byproduct out the back door and lying to the local residents about their health and their concerns attack on the responsible care price for dealing with your byproduct or shut your door. On heavy rains, we would still experience the backing up of water, which would basically cover two-thirds of our property, which would uh, bring with it the remnants of the woods. And now we know it was bringing the constituents of the landfill, which uh, brought in many other concerns. And at this particular point, uh, we feel that uh, our dog has been impacted by this uh, facility. We feel that the facility has uh, uh, done their very best to discredit us in the eyes of the local government as well as our local residents. And um, I, I have lost faith in the fact that the DEQ is not doing or re enforcing its regulations in the way, it, in the way it, for which it was designed. A BP oil is situated in, in the Myrtle Grove area. It covers uh, quite a considerable amount of anchors. It's a, a basic tank farm as well as a refinery. Uh, on the downwind side is a, uh, a minority uh, subdivision that had been basically there uh, from Excuse me. Um, oh, from from possibly the the, uh, the late 1800s. So you, you know that they were there first. Um, although the refinery has changed hands from Gulf Alliance to Sahio to BP, um, the the cooking process remains the same. The air discharges that have happened have driven the uh, the uh, residents out of their homes on on two occasions that I know of that were somewhat quite serious where the, uh, the, <clears throat> the officials or the uh, representing members of the refinery had uh, negotiated some sort of settlement or tried to assure to the people that there was no harm and that they shouldn't be concerned. And, but uh, from what I understand, there still hasn't been any technology or uh, air monitoring systems um, that, that would show uh, levels of concentrations or whatever that could be forcing these people from their homes or giving them their anxieties um, and their concerns, as well as the petrochemical uh, facility up the road uh, in the uh, lower Belches area where their, their landfill is actually uh, impacting the parish employees on Sewer Plant Road, which is a uh, um, not perforated, but which has pelted them with the dust from this landfill on uh, non-humorous days when the uh, landfill has had time to dry out and the wind cooks up pretty hard. Uh, you know, some 12, 15 mile hour gussy employees have had to sh close their doors to keep from um, being impacted and, and breathing this stuff. It's really been rather bad. And while we had actually made a non-compliance for this particular instance, it uh, was blocked by a member of the DEQ who claimed that uh, he had something else to do and he couldn't get out there at the time. And he made an investigation some four or five days later. And he went on a rainy day and claimed that he didn't see any dust. And uh, obviously, uh, this is where education comes in real serious, where you do employment. You know, uh, you know this, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Valley, New Orleans, 
I don't care, wherever you are, flush twice. We need the water, okay? Um, I should probably go ahead and donate my body to some sort of science because uh, a lot of people are sitting here telling you I'm drinking bottled water. Well, I'm sorry, I don't. I should, I don't. So perhaps one day you'll be able to cut me up like you did my dog and, uh, and, and analyze my innards and, and say that this individual shouldn't have been drinking the river water and uh, maybe we shouldn't have opened those diversion projects and put it into our food chain by seafood industry. Um, yeah, I'm concerned about it. I'm disgusted by it. Um, I don't understand it, you know. You tell me that uh, these people are regulating themselves and that while they have a permit to put phenol into the river of maybe 100 pounds or 300 pounds a day, whatever the regulation or the permit calls for, but yet employees in the plant tell me that they go out there and they open a valve to discharge into the river, there's no meter. And if you happen to think about going out there and closing the valve, then maybe you got your quota. If you didn't, you doubled up on it. Good for you, but you don't get caught. Who does the catching? And what happens when they get caught? Nothing. Sheila McGee, I live at 10607 Highway 23 in Belchase, Louisiana. I live just south of Chevron Chemical Plant, the Oak Point Plant in Belchase. Um, my major concern living near a plant is uh, health concerns for me and my family. Uh, I want to tell you that had I been as educated as I am today on environmental matters 15 years ago, I wouldn't live where I am. But unfortunately, I wasn't. I, I guess naive is the word to use. My husband and I felt that prevailing winds were up the road. The smokestack would not come our way. We never smelt the plant, and we wouldn't be impacted by this plant. However, 15 years down the road, I, I know different. Um, Children in my area have been impacted health-wise. Three that I know for sure have had bacterial infections, um, my son being one of them. About, it's been about three years now. He was hospitalized with an osteomyelitis, um, which normally affects children when they're about five to 10 years old. My son was 15 when this happened. Um, he was, uh, he started getting a high fever, he had pains in his back, and I guess for about two days, my mother and my father, who he lives with, didn't know what was wrong with him, thought maybe he had just pulled a muscle or something and just kept him in bed. And as the fever kept staying up and, and they couldn't get it down, they brought him to the emergency room. Well, as soon as they got him to the emergency room, he at that point couldn't move at all. Uh, they put him on a stretcher and just for someone to touch his finger or touch his shoulder, he would scream with pain. He was in pain like this for about a week and ran a fever up to 105, 106, and took alcohol baths and ice baths and did numerous bone scans and CAT scans and uh, needles through the pelvis and checking bone marrow and uh, checking for spinal meningitis and all the different tests that they do on children of this age and nothing was found what was wrong. Um, 10 days later, he was found to have an osteomyelitis, which is a bacterial infection that affects the bones. Um, it normally happens when you have an injury, you fall, you break bones, it punctures the skin and bacteria enters the bloodstream. It can, uh, bacteria can enter your bloodstream through your mouth. You can have blood, uh, bacteria that stays dormant for a long period of time. Had he ever had a bad, uh, uh, had a broken bone, this could have been a cause, but he had never had broken bones, so we were kind of puzzled about what happened. And um, I guess people at that hospital where he was was not real familiar with this. We had uh, requested that they do blood studies as far as chemical testing, and they did do some of these tests and found in some levels, uh, he was a little bit above average, but in most levels, he was within range limits. But they tell me that once you move away from a site, within a few years, the levels will start coming down in children. And he had already been away for three years. So we feel that that had some impact on it, and so we don't know. But, um, and I may have just put this to rest had we not heard from another young girl up the road who came down with a similar infection. And um, 
she was in a wheelchair for some time, and then right after that, another little boy. So living next to a chemical plant, the chemical plant can tell you all they want, that, that they're responsible, that they're checking, that, that nothing is going to enter the, the atmosphere or your water or your land without them knowing. But in my neighborhood, where there are 200, at least 200 people and, and several children, um, I, I question what they're responsible is to those children, because these people that work at this plant don't live in my neighborhood, and they're not as concerned as I am or some of the other parents in my neighborhood. I, I look at the children in the neighborhood, and, and I'm concerned because my son grew up with all these children, and it, it concerns me in, in other ways. Um, I see a lower uh, aptitude in school in my area, and, and I, I don't believe that my, the children that live in Belchase are more, are, are less intelligent than any of the other parish or any other state. I think that the environment that we live in affects how we are and how we grow up. And if children are who happen to be more susceptible to chemical uh, uh, metals and such, if, if the children are in an area where the chemical companies are not responsible and are perhaps putting something in the river or releasing something in the air that isn't good for children, then, then I think that those chemical companies have to, be, have to do something about it. And I think that the government the local government as well as national government should be looking at these things. I, I don't see that chemical companies should be regulating themselves, and I certainly don't see regulations being cut back. I, if anything, they need to be increased, and I believe that outside organizations need to come in. I know that when Chevron Chemical Company, when you hear the whistles and the bells go off, they don't allow the parish, the parish uh, fire trucks or anything, they don't allow them in the plant. They handle their own emergencies themselves. And how do we know with how they're handling it? We don't know. When we make non-compliances, it takes us a long time to get an answer. And we don't even know if we're getting the right answer. And so I guess my major concern is for the children in our neighborhood. And it's for, I, I want to know more about what are they doing and and their communication with us. They should be telling us, what, should, what are we, maybe we're doing something wrong. But there should be more communication between them and us, and definitely the local government has to be involved. They have to know what's going on in their neighborhood. They are responsible. I'm not sure how that would system would be set up. Um, there, there should be some outside, or, and I'm not sure that that would be even a, um, a government function. Um, maybe an independent company that, the, that would be um, a part of the government, maybe something separately. But there should be some, some reporting back to the families in the neighborhood and someone that they could trust and feel comfortable to talk to. A lot of times when you call uh, the DEQ hotline or uh, just the regular office in Metairie, you are, you're getting someone who's not real familiar with the area uh, doesn't really know what you're trying to portray to them and perhaps we're not speaking in their language and they're not understanding what we really mean. When we call them, we really mean something's wrong and we really mean that they should come check this out. And a lot of times they may just call the plant and over the phone solve everything and not even get back with us. And, and it takes us again another report to get back to get the information. When we make a non-compliance report, we should always hear back what, what that answer was, or at least what happened. And I think that's important. My name Williams, and I, I represent Peer. I live in Beers, Louisiana. And I've been around here for such a long time that I realize how many changes have taken place. Uh, and I think of this, I used to travel between uh, New Orleans and Houston, and we, we were always amazed when we got to Houston in the 1960s that the sunset was so yellow and everything looked yellow. And uh, by now, when they built this plant in Myrtle Grove, British Petroleum, 
I didn't notice the, at first I didn't notice the, the pollution till I got up around there. And by now, you don't have to leave home to, to see how polluted the area is. In the afternoon, when the sun's setting, there's nothing but orange and red sunsets. And people will say, oh, how beautiful. It's nothing but pollution. My ocean is, my Gulf of Mexico is no longer clean air. All the people down here have sinus trouble or runny nose or allergies. And I think it's air that uh, getting us all. I'm J.R. Hallen. I live in a, a neighborhood along Scenic Highway, directly across the street from the Exxon refinery. And I've been there for a number of years. I'm a family person who uh, basically has three kids in my home, along with a wife. And uh, some of my concerns is that uh, uh, basically they are economic uh, as well as uh, health concerns. And uh, I live there, and I've been involved with issues that face this community for probably six years. And um, there's a constant barrage of explosions, and when in many cases caused the death of some of the own workers there at these at these refineries. And um, we're probably almost never told the truth about what really go, what really goes on there. The most recent explosion, they were saying, well, uh, nothing hazardous has been released, but at the same time, they're telling you stay in the house, turn your air conditioners off. But, you know, that's kind of contradictory in itself. Uh, and by their own admission, they would release some uh, chemicals like uh, benzene uh, into the uh, atmosphere, and we know that's uh, a cancer-causing agent. And at the same time, these people are able to uh, dictate uh, certain things uh, that the state as well as the local government do, how their response back there. Uh, they recently installed a, what is called a community alert system that it was never sounded, you know. And we have people that live as, as short a distance as 100 yards from uh, some of these, uh, from the fence line. and. It seems that, that the first concern was not the community, it was the refinery. And that shouldn't be, you know. Uh, in other words, uh, I, I'm concerned that the Exxon uh, Cooperation uh, puts the dollars ahead of, dollars and cents ahead of uh, uh, safety and health and a number of other issues. Um, I've been involved in that, I've seen the uh, the struggle change, uh, and I've seen the agendas change. And actually, in some instances, uh, the refinery is able to dictate the struggle uh, because they're so large and powerful. Uh, it's almost every day you're wondering whether they're buying out the neighborhood or whether they are uh, actually get telling you the truth about what goes on over there. And it's a constant thing, and they actually are able to get into the minds of some of the people uh, that uh, uh, consider as neighbors and stuff there, and you kind of look at it and say, well, you know, we have a, a common goal, you know, and this is our neighborhood, but at the same time, you know, you got to realize that at the same time we're saying that this is a refinery and, uh, you know, it's doing uh, bad things to your health. It's also a large employer, and you know politics has a lot to do with that. They can go to the before the state government and say we employ X number of people. We are uh, making this uh, amount of contribution to the economy, and so we should be allowed a little latitude. And and they often get that. Um, you know, they have uh, in this state. Board of Commerce and Industry, they almost, they won't even listen to, uh, to the average person complaints such as mine. And, you know, it has a real concern there because I don't, we've made a lot of uh, 
progress, but it's just a long way to go. Yes, I can. Uh, actually, uh, shortly before 8 o'clock, I think it was 10 before 8, uh, the recent uh, accident at Exxon, uh, well, the ground kind of shook and there's a, you know, uh, give up on what definition they might say it was an explosion. They're saying a rapid ignition, but I'm saying it was an explosion. And um, it was nearly two hours before any kind of definition was given. People didn't know whether to go, stay, stay in the house or whatever it was. You know, it caused massive fear, uh, confusion, and actually, uh, the police at some point was asking the people, uh, were not letting people evacuate. But at the same time, I mentioned about this community alert system, um, it was never used. Uh, some two hours later, uh, the phone would ring and you'd get a recording that wasn't too specific. Um, that was a fish kill um, in a nearby bayou, a little canal like. And they were saying nothing toxic was released, but uh, there were several fish found floating uh, some several days later after the, this stuff was washed into the canal. So I, obviously, we didn't get the truth in that. Um, Tell them where you were and what it was like when it actually Well, I was in the yard, and my first concern after I called some of the older people around in the neighborhood, uh, at that point, she's. Uh, that was a 87-year-old lady across the street, and she can't hear good, uh, nor does she have any means of transportation. And that was, along with my kids, that was one of my concerns. And after I called around to try to find out something, the 911 operator, uh, they weren't specific. They didn't know what to do. Uh, actually, I think uh, some people in the neighborhood actually knew more than the uh, uh, emergency response teams. And uh, my first fear, was for my family and the people who just couldn't get out of the situation. After a, uh, a short period of time, I actually left. Um, I went uh, approximately eight or 10 miles away um, because knowing that there could be a chain reaction there, and, you know, the worst case scenario, that nobody determined how many people will survive if, if uh, we get the big one. You know, it's kind of like in California, people along Senior Highway, along all those um, given chemicals, um, they wonder when is the big one going to come. And so I don't know, that not knowing the answer to that, when the right chain of reaction comes, when I hear that the explosion, the first thing I think about is evacuate. At this time and since that date, we don't have an evacuation route. Uh, they said that they would work with us on getting one, but that's, you know, that was just said and it, uh, I asked the official that uh, Exxon to paint along the highway, evacuation route where the air was pointing away from it, uh, immediate danger. They haven't done that as of yet. And um, I, I think um, this is not only my concern. A lot of people there, they're always wondering, well, uh, what happens if a 747 since um, most uh, of the plant is directly in the path of, of the airport. You know, anything is possible. People always wonder, what happens if an airplane uh, falls in the plant? You know, what would happen? I don't know, and I hope this doesn't ever happen, but there's a lot of things that have never figured it, been figured into play. And living around a refinery is, leaves life from day to day very uncertain. One of the so, when you're talking about money and you're talking about people's lives and liable, livelihood, and if it actually does them an evil, which is the lesser of two evils? And they are not the ones. Most of the people who work there uh, do not live in the immediate area anyway. They're not the ones that smell the foul odors, and they're not the ones who awaken at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning with the flaring. And uh, they don't, uh, they are the ones who least affected by that. When you're saying regulated, the people who are going to do the regulation are not the ones that live across the street. Such as I, I live across the street, and I, I just uh, would like some input in that. Uh, I feel like any legislation uh, should uh, 
at least be exposed to the people who live the close, closest. Uh, uh, me along with some other people who were concerned about that had done a health survey and it was more than two years ago. Uh, and you'll find that um, 70 percent of the people who live within a one mile radius of a, a petrochemical company is uh, bothered by a breathing disorder. Uh, and you'll find that at least 60 percent of the people are, are, are bothered with eye itches, ear infections, and uh, and, and nausea and things like that. And it's all related. And I feel like it's directly related to uh, being that close to a chemical plant. And everybody there um, that's within a mile of a petrochemical company has a real concern about catching cancer. Uh, on one street alone, uh, more than two years ago, um, we had three couples, total of six people, to die of cancer. Coincident? I don't think so. Uh, Health is a real concern there, and uh, there's no system, there's no health tracking system um, presently that nobody has been able to uh, involve in that. And uh, this is something that um, a chemical company or a refiner will just shut on off. They don't, uh, they will never acknowledge that uh, these chemicals being uh, released into the air has a direct bearing on how the quality of your health. Yes, that the answer uh, to a lot of the problems and a lot of the answer to a lot of the conflict between neighbors certainly does not allow, does not lie in the hands of the people uh, uh, who, uh, who run and manufacture these chemical companies. I think the answer is right. Uh, in my, in my case, it's probably across the street. They didn't need to talk to the average person, the person who is down <coughs> the streets every day, the people who live there uh, and not necessarily um, earn a living at working at these places. But sure, I live in Alston, Louisiana. Uh, I live in an area where we have a hazardous waste company. We receive waste material not only from our state, but throughout the USA and possibly some foreign countries also. Uh, we have 15 chemical companies there in, the, in our little town. The population is 1,600, and uh, we are just surrounded by chemical company. We have an Exxon recent company there. Uh, it produces uh, uh, plastic. Although there's another one on Senior Highway, if they have an explosion down there, we do get, get some of the side effect of it, the vibration of it. Uh, I'm very concerned about Rawling because the uh, waste material from Exxon and all these other companies that are in my community, Rawling is burning this uh, this uh, waste material and it's 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 tox toxic chemicals, and we are in a in our small community. We've just 1,600. We receive at least 28 percent of the toxic waste there in uh, our little town. Uh, Rowling has put PCBs in uh, the Devil Swamp. Devil Swamp is being considered as a super fun site because of all of the. Uh, chemical waste that has uh, been placed in it. Uh, we have another uh, situation with Petro Processor, which was a co uh, company that received a lot of waste material in the 70s, and they literally dumped uh, chemicals and buried it in the ground. Now they are trying to clean it up. We have that, therefore we have two incinerators in our little town, and this is too much. This is causing health problems, and a lot of some of the health problems you have uh, itchy eyes, nosebleeds, sinus, uh, people who have died of cancer, uh, people who have um, kidney machine, and I am just upset with how DEQ worked with us. You call DEQ and make a report, and you ask for them to send you a report, and you discover that some names of people who have called 
are not listed. So they're not doing that good job. And if they came out, the uh, one report that I got say they found no uh, complaint. They didn't find anything that was wrong. Uh, we've had deal. We've been dealing with uh, commerce and industry on the tax break for Rowling. First of all, Rowling is not a manufacturing company. It's a has a waste company, and they do not meet the requ requirement for a tax break. And it's insult to our community, and ought to be insult to the state to even think about giving Rowling this tax break. And with the situation with Exxon, uh, I think it's ridiculous that they only find Exxon $1,200 for the damage that they did in August with the explosion, therefore granting them about a $90.4 million tax break. In my opinion, uh, commerce and industry, along with government officials, are not concerned about citizen welfare. All they are thinking about money. Bought the right, and I live in the community of Alson, north of Scotlandville. And we uh, have the chemical plants we have located around us, Rylands and um, Paxson, which is part of Exxon, and Hercules, which is part of Exxon. Dale Champ, there's a number of um, chemical plants that we are surrounded by, you know. And main concern is Rollins. That's the biggest concern. And petrol process, which they have uh, created a major problem and caused major health problems, I would say. But uh, you would never get nobody say to prove that, you know, because like we would go to the doctor for a checkup, you know, wouldn't no doctor say that uh, chemicals coming from those plants is causing what ailing us. Uh, so I'm a living witness of that, you know, that there's no doctor going to say that because uh, I have a problem now, skin problem right now that uh, no doctor will say that chemicals cause it when I know that chemicals could cause it, you know. But, yeah, uh, you can't get that proven by a doctor, you know. And um, we've been had this problem for years, you know, with these uh, plants. But we didn't know what was going on at the time. And terminated then, unbeknownst to the people of the community and which a lot of people relied on their swamp for survival, food, hunting, and fishing. And then years, I say, in the early 60s, along came Rollins. And that's when people began to really have problems, health problems, cancer, and different kind of uh, viruses, uh, it's, um, allergies, you know, sinus uh, uh, trouble, and all that. And They've really done a job, and they still done a job. They call themselves to clean up the act some, which they probably have to clean up the act some, but they're responsible for a lot of these sickness that have been caused, you know, by the stuff that they've been handling, you know. So what we need now is the government, you know, to tighten down on the, on the regulation, you know. And we need a health program there in our community because over the years we have a lot of people died from cancer and a lot of people being bothered right now, from, like I say, from sinus problems, you know, that they didn't normally have, running nose, itchy eyes, and I'd be bothered with that myself. Sometimes I go out in my yard right now, which I am less, I would say no more than 200 yards That's a lot what the federal government or, or the regulators need to do. Be more concerned about the people instead of the dollar <coughs> and these big plants that can put a dollar under the table in their pocket. They need to be worried about their citizens in the community. Sounds the people that are in the community, that we have to uh, suffer with this, you know, and, uh, and they don't live nowhere close around there. 
they're not the ones that uh, uh, they got to put up with the problem. So I think the, the regulation needs to be uh, tightened down and think about the people in the community instead of the dollar that you're going to get up under the table just from this big company or whoever. Just hope uh, that we uh, can get some response, you know, from uh, the struggle and the fight, you know, we're trying to, uh, trying to win. Hope we can get somebody to hear and come in with us, you know, and, and, and help support us, you know, and I hope sometime in the near future that maybe something can be done, you know, in, in the people's favor instead of always in the company big company's favor. Okay. With Dave Lehman, Andrea Clessy, and the entire Eyewitness News team, this is Eyewitness News. It turned the sky bright orange last night. And tonight, the fire is still going at Exxon. Good evening, everyone. It's only preliminary, but state police may have a cause for the Exxon fire. It may all be due to a metal belt. State police say that the blaze may have started when a metal strap supporting gas lines simply snapped. The gas lines apparently collapsed and sparked a series of explosions. State police spokesperson Bobby Guidro says that a band that holds up the gas lines is believed to have snapped. But Exxon officials are saying something rather different. I, I know that the investigating committee has already talked with some of the people that were out here on site when the explosions occurred, and we've not been able to confirm anything uh, of that type at this point. And Exxon officials say that they will begin their own investigation when the fire burns itself out. Our own Dan Cambry has been at Exxon all day, and right now he's got the prime seat to see what's going on at the chemical plant. He's up in a helicopter. Dan, you got to talk with some Exxon workers today. What are they saying about the explosion? Well, to all of the people that we talked to, all of the workers coming out of Exxon, told us they have no idea. They're not being told anything exactly as to what caused the explosions in the fire, Andy. As you mentioned, we had the best seat in the house, and we, we certainly do. This has been an interesting fire to watch today. At times, as you can see now, this fire looks like it's almost out. You barely see any flames, and then all of a sudden, 20, 30 seconds later, uh, the flame will spew up. It'll be about 20 feet high. Before any of this, if we get any kind of final answers, these flames are going to have to go out. The unit's going to have to cool off, and it's going to be at least a day or so before, after the fire go out, goes out, that Exxon officials tell me that they can get in here and really do some hard investigating. Things just have to cool off, Annie. Mm-hmm. Uh Sure looks a lot different, though, from last night. Well, it certainly does. Last night, the sky was bright orange, a big plume of smoke. And you know, folks, all of this pipe rack, this maze of pipes that you're seeing and, and valves, probably doesn't mean much to you. I can give you a little human touch on this. What you see on fire down there is the steam cracking unit. What that means to you is that unit makes products that in the long run will, will turn out rubber for your car tires, alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and a lot of products in between. So it's a very versatile unit that Exxon officials say they'd like to get back up and get into production soon, but they emphasize, Annie, that they want to do it safely. And of course, the good news that we keep telling people is that apparently no serious injuries here, only a sprained ankle last night. And that's probably the best news when you see the fire that, that we saw and the magnitude of it in the dark sky last night. You're right, it sure does look a lot different. Okay, Dan, thank you very much. That was Dan Cambry aboard Air Med. Aboard Air Med. Dave? And let's take a look at last night. Dozens of workers running from a plant, a plant that shook, sending flames hundreds of feet into the air. Scared neighbors shaken from their prime time couches. And the rest of us worrying about what was in that jet black cloud filling the skies over the plant. That's the way that many will remember August the 8th, 1994. That, that scared me more than anything I've ever been scared before in my life. Because, I mean, my life, you know, it didn't dawn on me until after we got to a safety point what could have happened. Well, it shook whenever it first happened. I mean, probably for about a couple of seconds at the most. It shook us in the rack a little bit. Richard and Scott Martinez, brothers and fellow workers here at the Exxon Chemical Plant, frozen in place momentarily when the cracking unit exploded just before 8 o'clock last night. 
You could see the flames and the smoke for miles. Flames shooting hundreds of feet into the air. Fire hoses barely made a dent. City police closed the interstate, at least for a while. People turned off air conditioners and fans, fearing that that smoke, the thick, billowy smoke, was poisonous. Area monitoring at the burning plant, however, showed that it was not. Some were ready to evacuate, but that, too, was unnecessary. The cracking plant, which takes oil byproducts and boils them down to make other chemical products, would burn on for hours. Calm winds saved the day and the night. For three and a half hours, firefighters battled the blaze, finally bringing it under control. The big news, and of course the best news, was that no one was killed or seriously injured. A miracle when you consider the potential. And this, of course, follows a series of fires and explosions at the Exxon complex over the past years. Andrew? You know, Dave, just across Scenic Highway, hundreds of families literally live in Exxon shadow. They felt the explosion last night and saw the smoke, but then they didn't hear anything. No sirens, no warning. Bob Goldberger reports the city just installed an elaborate loudspeaker system for just such an occasion, but decided not to use it. We wonder what was going on. We got an emergency system, they don't even use it. Leo Bologna isn't the only one wondering that today. Just about everybody in Garden City has the same question. The city just installed these expensive solar-powered combination siren loudspeakers to warn people here when there's an emergency. But while flames were licking the sky in a chemical fire at Exxon, practically across the street from Maybell, London, the sirens were silent. Three or four weeks ago, they tried it out and had us all running out of house, you know, wondering what was going on and everything. And then when there's and, a real emergency, they didn't the, use it. That's right. That was a conscious decision by city emergency officials. Since the fire was not toxic and there was no need to evacuate, they decided to pass up the sirens and send neighbors this phone message instead. At this time, air monitoring shows no immediate danger to the public. They fully realized the computer phone bank would only reach about 60% of the neighbors, more than an hour after the explosion. But officials say they were more concerned about panicking people with the siren. But that reasoning doesn't sit well with Ovi and Linda Brown. Linda grew up across from Exxon. We need the information and let us make our own decision whether we want to get out of the area early or not. Now, of course, hindsight is always 2020, but now the city leaders have had a full day to reflect on last night's incident. The mayor says he tends to agree with neighbors here that the city probably should have used its new siren system to at least inform neighbors of the situation. He says this is the first time that they've had an emergency since they installed the new sirens, and the mayor promises next time they will be more prepared. More prepared in what way, Bob? Well, right now the city only has three recorded messages that it can broadcast over that siren to neighbors here. All three of those messages are sort of worst case scenario, you need to evacuate right now. The mayor says they definitely will add at least a fourth message, which will say something to the effect that there has been an incident at one of the plants. Please go inside your house. There is no immediate danger, but turn on your television and radio to listen for more information. That's the kind of message they needed last night. They simply didn't have it. That is indeed the kind of message they needed. Right. Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah. It's not very large, but the fire is still burning this evening at Exxon Chemical. More than 22 hours after explosions on the plant ground shook a North Baton Rouge neighborhood last night. Flames still being fed this evening by a butane and propane in a steam cracking tower. Meanwhile, state police are giving a tentative cause of the blast last night at 7.48 p.m., but Exxon is disputing that conclusion, and that's not the only dispute tonight. We have a series of reports, first from WAFB's George Caldwell. It'll likely be some time before officials have an estimate on what Monday night's blast will cost. But even in the wake of such a spectacular and frightening light show, the plant is back up and running. Officials say the steam cracker that blew is one of several, and it shouldn't slow down production too much. The overall impact on the plant itself, the other units in this plant, is very hard to predict because we can, in fact, bring in raw materials from other uh, resources. Meantime, the folks who were inside when this inferno broke out are still recovering today. Contract worker Rex Young was less than 200 yards from the blast. He'd been a contract worker at Exxon for just a week. It was basically a big boom. Yeah. I, saw, I thought they might have dropped something like a crane, might have dropped a big beam. Yeah. But actually, it was just an explosion, and I felt a big heat wave come over. And that was pretty scary right there. I thought I was going to die. 
But despite the deployment of hazmat and despite the intense blaze, nobody died. Some have been critical of Exxon's handling of evacuating workers, but Rex said he simply got his partner and moved from there. And he came out and we just went down and they were just telling us to be calm, walk, go to the assembly point. We went there and everything was handled pretty good. But there are questions about how good Exxon is. Just a year and a week ago, three died in an explosion here. And of course, there was the Christmas Eve blast of 1989. But despite all this, LSU expert Michael Hooks says he'd rate Exxon's overall safety performance at about an eight out of 10. He says they're just victims of bad luck considering the amount of dangerous materials they handle. Exxon officials say they hate these situations, but they're ready for them. Well, although you never want something like this to happen, we plan for it, we, we practice for it. I'm George Caldwell, live at Exxon Chemical, where you can see 22 hours after the blaze started, it is still going. Now, state police officials are saying that they do think they have at least a preliminary cause for this thing. They say they believe a belt supporting gas lines snapped, and when those lines fell, it caused sparks which set off the explosion. Now, we talked to some Exxon folks about this, and the people at Exxon say they can't understand where state police got this idea for the simple reason that the flames are still burning. You can't even get in there at this point. They don't think that there's any way to find out. Now, one last thing we'd like to pass along to you, a lot of folks out there who work at Exxon, and we're told that all Exxon employees, both contract workers and regular employees, are asked to show up at work on time tomorrow. Back to you. Okay, thanks very much. George Caldwell at Exxon Chemical. Mayor Tom Ed McHugh and officials who handle hazardous material situations say they first learned of trouble at the Exxon chemical plant, not from their own emergency sources, but from the news media last night. WAFE's James Rose has been following up on the story today. And James, you tell us the timing of the communication between city officials and Exxon personnel appears to be a key factor in what's less than a perfect rating, right? That's right, Donna, a seven. That's how the mayor rates the overall performance, response, and communication of all parties involved in last night's explosion at Exxon's chemical plant. I heard a loud booming noise and felt the house shake. A big boom, and it just like knocked me off the couch. Anything? No, we did not hear any, any warning system go off. That was last night. Many residents here saw flames shooting hundreds of feet into the air. And today, that fire has all but died out. And many residents here are wondering why they never heard any sirens. And some city officials are playing Monday morning quarterback. There was a time discrepancy in the initial call, in the explosion, in the initial call to our communication system. We've talked with Exxon about that. Another form of communication that may have been delayed was in the community alert system, better known as CAL. It uses sirens, loudspeakers, and computer-generated phone calls to advise people of what to do in an emergency. CAL officials say they made their first computer-generated calls at 827. That's nearly 40 minutes after the explosion. They say they successfully contacted more than 60% of the people in the surrounding area, but no loudspeakers were used. Hazardous material officials on the scene say that's because they toured the plant early on and deemed it was not necessary. Uh, that information led us to saying that we don't need them to take an immediate action to protect themselves. So that early information led us to, to hold off on the sirens. The mayor says the overall experience was positive, no loss of life, and a lot of lessons learned. I think if we, you know, looking back hindsight, uh, we, we would have been well to use the, the other two aspects of the system. But now, Exxon spokesman Brian Brabston says no one outside of Exxon was notified for about 20 minutes following the explosion. Brabston says they were excited and very busy assessing the situation. He says it was unfortunate and it should not have happened. And he says the problem has now been corrected. Donna, if there is perhaps a moral to the story is that, number one, there were a lot of lessons learned. And it was the first time the CAL system has actually been put to the test. And they say it worked very well. Residents heard the boom and then expected to hear Cal right away. The they were on sometimes. our phones last night. Sure yeah. were. Thanks. Well, it may be hard to imagine now, but North Baton Rouge was not always dominated by the massive industrial complex. There are those who remember it before the explosions and people who live with those memories every day. WAFP's Marcin Goldsby introduces us to one very single-minded lady. Okay. This little patch of backyard is all that's left of a long-gone era. The yard and the gentle lady guarding it are a single snapshot of a time when North Baton Rouge was a safer place to live. It was nice and friendly. We knew people from blocks and blocks. 
Edna Jeffrey's family moved here in 1925. Now her neighborhood is the massive Exxon complex and its network of parking lots. She talks about the explosions almost casually. I've been through one where it blew almost every window out of the house. I could not walk in my house without stepping on glass. That one was, she says, sometime in the 1970s. The next big one was 1989 at the refinery. When that one exploded, uh, it just blew the doors, the French doors, wide open. And um, I think on that explosion, I only got about three busted windows. Then there was last night. It was just too close for comfort, really. <laughs> and it was hot. I have to tell you honestly, if you were my mother or my aunt, I'd be doing everything I could to get you to move. Well, all my friends and what relatives I have left, they are on me about it, too. They said, uh, they just don't know how I'll stay here. Exxon has bought out most of her former neighbors, and she says they have made her offers, too, but none good enough to pay for her memories. If they were to come up with a really good offer to you that would allow you to buy a house and have a lot to live on, do you think you would take it? At this stage of the game, I don't think so. I, I, I made up my mind that I just wasn't going to move. Marcy Ann Goldsby, WAFB News. By the way, Ms. Jeffries did leave her home last night, but only for a short while. She tells us that she and her nephew went back to check on her dog.